Okay. Welcome Naomi Shim from Doubting Thomas. Uh, <laughs> we wanted to ask you some questions about how you got into being a chef. So where did, where did your interest in cooking begin? Well, thank you for having me. Um, like your students, it started off with just an interest in cooking. And um, I just loved food and eating. And um, what I did was I just um, went to different restaurants in L the LA area. And um, I just always like, I left, I would like read the LA Times, the food section, and you know, read about different um, chefs and restaurants. And um, back then, it wasn't really that popular. Like the the chef, um, like the Food Network wasn't that popular, and um, there weren't any real name chefs out there. But um, the chefs that I were interested uh, that I was interested in, I just knocked on their doors and asked them if I can um, stage for them, which means uh, apprentice. And so I would just work for free, um, sort of like what your daughter Chloe did at Downing Thomas, and um, she started off with us working, um, you know, for a summer for a few hours, and then now you know she's an employee during the summertime. Um, so, you know, one thing led to another and I didn't really, um, plan on becoming a chef. I, I actually wanted to, um, I was a teacher. I, I, my first stage was during graduate school. Um, I was getting my master's in education and I staged with a, a French chef named Claude Segal. And, um, I worked, you know, as many hours as I could with him. And then I would, you know, study and then I eventually got my master's and I and I taught for four years, but um, I sort of still was feeling the itch for cooking. So I went back into cooking and then um, and then I became a pastry cook and then I became a pastry chef. Um, and it was always for chefs that I was very much uh, curious about in terms of like their ethos and um, their artistry and what inspired them and um, yeah and so and then and then and then there was this third wave coffee um, explosion um, that happened and then um, launching pastry programs for these third wave coffee companies became my niche and I saw the profit margins and just how much money these coffee bars were making and I decided to open my own shop and here I am. <laughs> wow so you were like a teacher for four years while you were still nursing this idea of being a chef. Um, by yeah. the way as she's sharing if you guys have questions you can feel free to I, I can't see all your hands but you can feel free to write in the chat and she can answer them along the way or at the end when we do see all of them. Um, what, so did you have any, is there any training or education or skills required to go into um, becoming a chef? I know there's so many, like we say chef, but is it really, is it really just a chef position? Of course. Yeah, of course there are uh, schools out there. Um, Like in New York and San Francisco, there are plenty of cooking schools, even in France. And, um, but I would say the best education is in the contextualized environment, just in the kitchen. It's at the end of the day, it's a very physically laborious job. And um, it's very instinctual too. So I would say the best way to learn is, um, it's the old school way is by staging, you know? Like the old, old school meaning like old European way of just, you know, starting like your age. The chefs that I very much admire, um, like Gino Angelini, he's probably the best Italian chef in Los Angeles. He started um, as a 14 year old um, cooking in a restaurant. And um, yeah, I would say that that's the best way to learn and the best way to build a repertoire. Um, How many hours are, am I in the 
in the shop for? Um, right now, it took a while. So in May, um, Downing Thomas will turn three years old. Um, and I see it sort of like, right now it's like a toddler, you know, it's just like, it's kind of running around. Um, and in the beginning, it took a lot of babying and I had to be there all the time. Like my hours were crazy in the first year. I remember that, that the first few months I was there from like 8 a.m. to midnight. And <laughs> um, it, it just, it took a while to, I think probably the most important and valuable resource um, in any industry is uh, our people, you know, the talent and the brains behind um, the operation. And so that always, it's the most important, but it takes the longest to, to find and um, set in place. And so now I actually like, I have a normal weekend. I take, you know, Sunday and Monday off. And then I'm probably in the shop for like eight to 10 hours a day, aside from my weekends which is a considered a vacation compared to, you know, by other chefs who work. Well, you know, obviously COVID has changed things, but, you know, working 14 hour days was, was the norm back in the day. I remember you saying, and Kylie, we'll get to your question in a second. I remember you saying that you almost left the industry because the hours and, and just the lifestyle was so difficult. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, I did actually leave the industry and I couldn't, I couldn't for, uh, it was difficult to get back into the district at LAUSD um, because at the time that I wanted to go back into teaching, um, there are more teachers in jobs. And so I ended up teaching at a private Orthodox Jewish school um, for a year. And I left, yeah, I left because I was, a, a, back then I was a dessert chef and when you're a pastry chef and you're the last course, um, you just, you're the last one out. And it's, I just feel it's not, you know, it's different for other d different people. But for me, I felt it wasn't, it wasn't good for my soul to be there so late. And I very much, um, when I got into Venoiserie um, Morning Pastries, I, I very much appreciated like waking up with the sun you know that that was definitely more healthy for me how late did you have to stay when you were doing a regular restaurant and dessert pastries um it depended sometimes it was you know midnight sometimes 1 a.m you know and then another drawback in the fine dining industry is just, there's just a lot of alcoholism and then you witness that in the back of the house you know in the kitchen um as well as um you know watching customers get hammered and it just like I didn't, I didn't, I didn't like being exposed to that. Yeah. It was a little depressing, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> and then you're kind of stuck back in this kitchen where everybody's like <laughs> not living their best life. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, Kylie's question. How did you come up with the name Doubting Thomas? Um, it's sort of a long story, but I, my, one of my favorite tapas bar in, um, uh, in Catalonia, Spain, it's called Bar Tomas. And I just like the, the ring of that. And then, so I actually thought that I was gonna name my, whatever place that I opened up Bar Tomas. Um, but then also there was like, a, I made the connection between that and then um, one of my favorite um, characters in the Bible when it, it was Christ's disciple, Jesus, and their relationship between the, the relationship between Christ and Thomas always intrigued me. Um, just the tenderness of the relationship and um, yeah, and the whole concept of doubt is is something that everyone I feel can relate to, whether it's self-doubt or other people doubting you. Um, and I thought it would be a great, you know, conversation starter. And it, it always, people always ask, you know, on a weekly basis, why doubting Thomas? And so, you know, it definitely, um, it instigates dialogue for sure. By the way, she said tapas bar and not topless bar. Sometimes when yeah. <laughs> tapas bar is like a like these small Spanish dishes. Um, okay, what what is like a regular day for you? Like a regular day for a chef? 
You know, as a business owner, it's different every day. Like today I have to do payroll and I do that once every couple of weeks. Um, tomorrow I go to the farmer's market and I do that once a week. And um, yeah, so every day is different. As a, as a chef chef, it would probably, um, you would probably be in production, you know, um, for much of the day. Uh, and then there would be like the plating portion, depending on what kind of restaurant that you, you work in. Um, there would be like plating and there's always a routine inventory um, at the end of a shift. You know, there's always like the organization of the walk in um, that, you know, goes hand in hand with inventory. If you let's say if you had like a teenage son or daughter who is interested in going into cooking or the restaurant industry, what would you say are some of the pros and cons as it, as they kind of look into this? Cause like as a teacher, I also feel like, yeah, I love teaching, but if my child wanted to go into teaching, I'm not sure I would be like, go for it. Um, definitely. Yeah. Okay, so the pros, the the pros is that um, it's very creative. I mean, once you get to like a higher level position, like as a chef, like or, or as a sous chef, um, it's it's a def, it's fun. The creative part is very fun. I thrive off of that. Um, and you see like culture evolve, and then you're part of that culture. You get to influence culture. That's always the most exciting for me. And um, there's always dialogue um, and there's always learning and there's always teaching. Um, and so those are definitely a few of the pros. And um, you're always in, you know, the kitchen is, is a very enclosed space. So you're always in community, whether you like it or not. Um, and, you know, like if anything, if we've learned anything from COVID is that, you know, uh, community is essential for the soul, you know? And so like our, I know that our kitchen, we've just bonded through this whole um, pandemic and we've really leaned on each other. So that's definitely one of the, the pros to being a part of the kitchen is that you instantly become part of a community. You instantly become a, a part of an ecosystem. And so, um, yeah, that's always cool and enjoyable. Um, the cons would probably be what I referenced to earlier is, is like, and maybe there's this in a lot of industries, it's just, you know, the alcoholism, the self-medicating. Um, when I was in fine dining, like cocaine was really popular, you know? And so um, that it was almost normal for chefs that worked 14 hours to, um, I mean, working 14 hours in a kitchen on your feet, it's not sustainable in the, in, to begin with. So of course something's gonna happen and um, cocaine happened, you know, that what that's what temporarily sustained them. Um, so that was definitely a con, but um, yeah, I would, it's, it's really fun and I, I definitely encourage if you have like any sort of glimmer of interest just to just to try it out, you know, I think you're at a, you know, age where you should just be like trying everything out and um, exploring exploring and I think exposure is like the best way to um, to learn and, and find out if this is your calling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Question from Jacob, are there any chefs you admired to help you become the chef you are today? Oh yeah, for sure. Um, Gino Angelini, um, who I talked about earlier, um, he, I definitely respect his ethos. Um, you know, like with, during COVID, I think there was a lot of, um, a, lo a lot of, uh, with cancel culture, it kind of influenced the restaurant community and that people were called up for like, um, for toxic toxicity in their kitchen. 
and um, he was definitely progressive in the sense that like toxic people wouldn't last in his kitchen, you know? And he always um, encouraged creativity. And at the end of the day, it, was, it wasn't about impressing people and it wasn't about his ego. At the end of the day, it was, it was bringing people pleasure, you know? Um, and, and I think that's what made his food uh, so soulful people like he they tasted his you know the love in the food and not they didn't taste like um coldness or arrogance or anything like you know negative what what restaurant does he have what's the name uh, right now um he has outdoor seating that reopened on friday uh angelini osteria uh -huh. yeah and then there's like an adjacent cafe that he runs as well but he's He's really, I pray for him, his, he's, he's getting old and he's had different health problems. So you guys need to get in there before, <laughs> um, before he retires. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, is, what is the salary range for this career? Um, back in the day, it was normal to, like 10, 20 years ago, it was normal to be earning like really peanuts, like 30, like $30,000 a year, you know, $40,000 a year. Um, and it was uh, definitely, it had to be a labor of love because, you know, you can't, you can't be in it for the money because it does not pay well. Um, but the salary, I like in hotels, they, you know, you would get benefits and more of a normal salary, like um, 60 to, I imagine even 80, you know, thousand dollars a year, depending on what hotel it is yeah, and how big it is, how wealthy the company is. Mm -hmm. So basically it's not, it's going to be difficult to really pay a lot of bills having that career or supporting a family. Especially start in the beginning. Yeah. In the beginning. Um, so if, if you want to become a chef, you need to save up money right now. <laughs> You want money and right now and like prepare for the lifestyle of, of being a poor chef you know a poor cook for at least a few years uh -huh. until you get to the higher levels yeah um what do you think of who's that guy who cusses all the time what do you think of that guy? <laughs> oh, gordon ramsay yeah gordon ramsay you know he's great in that he's so honest and and it does give people exposure to like how cutthroat it used to be, but I think things are definitely changing in that. Like you, you just can't pe put people down like that. You know? <laughs> um, but he, of course he, it's, it's really funny. He's, he's comedy. And I've, have I, oh, I've seen him before. And I met his mentor, um, Marco Pierre White. Um, that was really cool meeting him. We talked about like all the different things that you can um, microwave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, um, do you mind, are you at your shop right now? Can you like yeah. give us a little look around? Of course. Um, I'm not tech savvy. So should I just like turn around my, <laughs> my laptop? Sure. I'm going to go out this door. So this is, this is, I'm in the office right now. Okay. Oh, I didn't know you had an office. Oh. So this is the office. This mm -hmm. is what I've been facing. <laughs> and then it's also our dry storage. So no indoor seating still. Wait, you know what? I need to I need to grab my mask. Oops. I always forget that. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Okay, let's go out this way. So this is our dry storage, our lockers, okay? This is our freezer. This is all of our dry things. We have like three dollies. There's two over there, one over here. Men's bathroom. We have outdoor seating now. Yay. Hi. <laughs> Hi. That's her mom. 
coffee shop. Hey, our barista. Hi, barista. <laughs> This is Abraham, our cook. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> this is where we roll out our dough. Please see. Yeah, this is our um, our sheeter where we roll out our croissanto. Mm. They make the most amazing pastries, you guys. If you ever get a chance to go. Hello, how are you? Um, this is where we wash our dishes. Hi, Juana, say hi. Hi. Hello. <laughs> and then this is our walk in fridge. It's packed. Uh oh. I don't know if you guys saw, but there's also like a cooking area stove too. Oh yeah, do you want to see that? <laughs> Here, hold on. So they do pastries and then they also cook. Yeah, so this is our range. This is our fryer. Wow, everything's so clean. Another speed rack, our double deck oven. We hang all of our tools here. Can we so see we what it's, it's really see? fun to take photos because of the um, the floor to ceiling windows. Yeah. It's so much natural light. Uh huh. Yeah. These are the you have, oh, yes, the pastries. Oh my gosh. Those are so good. Yeah. This is the seating area that hopefully it'll open up soon. Mm -hmm. The men's bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice clean bathroom, especially for the men. <laughs> so there it is. Nice. I think I just had one last question that was on my slideshow that I wanted to ask and you sort of answered it, but if you could just kind of say like a person in this career, like in like a, like a sentence, like what does a person in this career do? Like, um, Cause it's not just cooking. Is there, what, what what would you say are like the main tasks of someone who is a, a chef? Well, as a chef owner, you can hear me still, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. As a chef owner, um, there's a lot of management mm -hmm. and then just a lot of um, growing as people. And in fact, this pandemic has turned me into a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> I've had like at least like four or five employees like be in this office and just like break down and cry. Oh just man. All, all the anxiety and the stress mm -hmm. um, that this pandemic has brought. Um, so yeah, a lot during this, pan this past year has just been like growing, growing people. Mm -hmm. and um, telling them, making sure that they remember that their value as people is not productivity. And you can get in different kitchens, that's the message that a lot of chefs like Gordon Ramsay <laughs> uh -huh. are like preaching to you is that like your value ends at productivity uh -huh. and it doesn't, you know, you're like, you're so much more than what you produce. Mm -hmm. And um, and so just, uh, growing people and um making it trying to like offer incentive enough incentive for them to stay because it's it's the nature of the industry is that it's a, a revolving door a lot of people come and go and mm -hmm. so you need to give them like 
uh, constantly be teaching them, making sure that they're learning, making sure that they're growing, uh, making sure, and just not just growing in like what they can do, their repertoire, but growing as, as leaders, you know, mm -hmm. um, and as people. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have any questions? Any other questions for Naomi? Uh, I have a question. Um, is it like different? How do you like keep it clean, especially during COVID, like in the kitchen and stuff? Um, yeah, we're, we're definitely constantly wiping down. And that was our MO uh, before this whole pandemic. The culture of the kitchen is very, it, it should be. Um, and the French are very good at this. And I feel blessed to have like been trained by French chef, but um, it should be very sterile, you know, constantly like wiping down. And we're gonna have a meeting, a, a team meeting this Thursday, a doubting, a doubting Thomas staff meeting. And it's something that people have to, we have to reteach, people have to relearn over and over is constantly like um, resetting your station, you know, sterilizing and wiping down every time you uh, finish a product project like um, you need to sterilize the area so Bella asked what food is your which food is your favorite to make right now pie like pies in any form right now we have um a blood orange blueberry hand pie I do our probably the most popular right now is our passion fruit pie um, I've always loved pie and I, I think it's because I love the juxtaposition of the fruit and like crust, like a brise, like a tender flaky brise crust matched paired with a, a fruit that's peaking. Like at the end of summer, um, it would be like peaches or any stone fruit. In early summer, it would be like a Santa Rosa plum. Ellie, question? Um, did you go to cooking school? You know, I took a, I took a course in Paris, um, but it was very touristy. So I, <laughs> did, I did, there are a bunch of Americans in there and then I didn't learn much because I had already, um, I already knew everything that they were teaching because I had self-taught myself that. And um, so I think that was, that was my only, cooking school experience and it only reaffirmed um, what I'm telling you guys is just get in the kitchen to learn, you know? Do you make peach cobbler? I love peach cobbler. Yeah, I don't, I like, I favor the one that has the, the brise, the, um, the, the flaky crust on top, as opposed to the biscuit top. I like that, um, the, the pie crust on top of the cobbler. Um, Sophia, is that your hand? Yeah, how long have you been doing this for? So I was getting my graduate degree when I was 23. So about two decades. Yeah. But were you cooking when you were like a teenager? Yeah, well, I was cooking when I was like, when I was eight or nine. My mother would make pies for us as an after-school snack. And so we would always help out with that. Your yeah. pies are amazing. I had, I'm had i not a pie dessert person, but oh my gosh, like I had a banoffee pie and I just, I still like talk about it. It was so amazing. I think that the graham cracker crust with like the toasted coconut in there was like yeah. dreamy. How do you not get fat? Oh, well, as I said, it's, it's at the end of the day, it's a, you know, physically demanding job. And so I'm always moving around. Rarely do I take more than a 15 minute break just because I feel as though it would like interrupt my momentum. But what about all those other chefs that are really large? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, maybe it's genetic. Yeah, and then also sugar is sort of, uh, it kills the palate. And I, I constantly have to, I, ha I have a toothbrush in my toolbox. So I have to brush my teeth to clean my palate. Um, yeah. Oh, interesting. Um, uh, Kylie's question, do you think you'll be busy for Valentine's Day? 
Yeah, probably. But you know what? I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be in San Francisco on a trip. And um, I think it's, we'll see with, with COVID, of course, like all the fine dining restaurants get really busy. Uh, Valentine's Day has, has always been my least favorite ho <laughs> favorite holiday. So I, I've never really, um, I think just because, you know, coming from my background, it was always the busiest day of the year and I was the dessert chef. So there's always oh pressure to do something yeah. really cheesy and corny. And so um, I, I, I think I developed an aversion to it. And so now I'm just like, eh, whatever. If I feel like doing something, I will. Uh -huh. Yeah. Ellie, did you have another question? Oh, yeah. Do you eat your do you eat your shop's food? Yes, but I get tired of it really quickly, which is why I'm constantly coming up with new things, you know, and that helps um, in terms of um, people always coming in. I think what what brings people in are the specials. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I notice that you add like a, like an Asian fusion to many of your dishes, mm -hmm. and that makes it kind of um, intriguing, and people want to try it. Yeah, I think Angelinos in Los Angeles, people are very open to um, like mixing different cultures, whether it's like Mexican and Korean, or like being uh, the original fusion, you know, Vietnamese and French. Mm -hmm. Um, I have another question. I know, uh, oh, Trevor, did you have a question? Where were you scratching your head? Um, <laughs> I know that you're not um, like a sushi chef, but I was kind of curious um, if you know, like if you have any opinion about being a sushi chef or what that entails. Um, I have a cousin who got into that line of cooking. I mean, I'm sure it's similar in in the the pros and cons of it. Like, I'm sure it's very it's creative and um, very technical and craft driven. Yeah. Probably a lot of alcoholism there too, because I feel like everybody's giving the sushi chefs. <laughs> Uh, the drink. <laughs> All right, so we'll take maybe two more questions if anyone has any more questions. I, I, I'm so hungry now. I just want to go over to your shop and, and eat something. <laughs> Do you have like um, a website or like types of recipes that you um yeah favor or you just do your own recipes um instagram has become a really good resource who do you um, follow who do you follow <laughs> um, there's a, like the old school like in a garden you know i'm not and i and then there's another lady who just came out with her own show um zoe something um uh, do you favor like French food? I, I see a lot of these chefs at the farmer's market too. Mm. I do. I probably, I'm a, I'm a Francophile, mm -hmm. self-professing uh, Francophile. So definitely. And, you know, my, those are my first experiences mm -hmm. was in French cuisine. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Zoe Francois is her name and her handle Zoe Bakes. I follow mm -hmm. her, I like her stuff. Mm -hmm. I, like her, I definitely like her vibe. And a friend of mine, uh, Rose Wild, and her handle is T-R-O-S-E-W-I-L-D-E. -E. Her stuff is really beautiful. I see her every, every week at the farmer's market. Mm. T-R-O-S-E? Yes. W I L D E. Uh huh. And of course, Nancy Silverton. Uh -huh. I've always considered her like a mentor. Yeah. 
All right. Well, um, oh, Kaylee, did you have any questions? I know you love baking. Or anyone else? Not to put you on the spot there. I have a question. Okay. Last um, question. Okay. Um, is there any like chefs you would like to meet that you haven't met yet? Um, today, it's funny, I just responded to an email um, from David Chang. Um, oh, yeah. CEO Marguerite. And I'm pretty, we'll probably meet soon. And I'm really stoked about that. Yeah. I think he's massively talented. And more than that, he's just funny. <laughs> yeah. They're funny and down to earth. Uh-huh. Do you guys have a thing with dogs? Because I know you post a lot of dog pictures with your, or you used to. You yeah, have. There's so many beautiful dogs that live upstairs. We, we're actually at the, this retail space is at the bottom of a, um, a, a residential building. There's so many dogs that live upstairs and they're the cutest. Yeah. And then we, you know, we have like dog, dog treats. So some oh, of the nice. parents actually come around to Downing Thomas more for their dogs, more for their <laughs> dogs than themselves. <laughs> They're so lucky to live right above you. How nice. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for taking this time out of your busy day. And we just really appreciate all the, the information that you shared with us. Thank right? you for having me. Lovely meeting you guys. Yeah, and hopefully you guys can go visit Doubting Thomas sometime. It's in, it's in LA. I mean, what what would you say? Like, what part of LA? Probably, with, um, yeah, Echo Park and Silver Lake adjacent. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've been there before. It was good. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey. Yeah. You went for like a. Oh yeah, your. Your, someone you knew adopted a, a child and they went there for? Yeah. Um, do you remember like Cody, Cody's adoption? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, you were there? <laughs> yeah. Oh sweet, so you know my cousin. Yeah, That's I think so. Uh-huh. <laughs> small world. I know, small world. All right guys, I can't wait to see what oh the restaurant in the chat so the restaurant is called doubting thomas and is if they just google doubting thomas they'll find it right mm -hmm. doubting thomas la um yeah and you guys are open just in the morning and early afternoon yeah right now our um our hours are 7 30 to 3. 7 30 to 3. Okay. That's Every nice. Day. That's nice for you to end early. I think that's what makes the restaurant business like livable because you're not staying up till midnight. Yeah. In the shop. Mm -hmm. Do you have to come early though? Cause I like, what time? Uh, I have opening bakers. I have an opening baker and an opening cook. They come here. Um, my baker comes to, uh, checks in at, at 5 a.m. And then our cook comes in at seven. Oh. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, you guys. Uh, thank you, Naomi, and thank you, you guys, for listening. And um, we'll let you go, Naomi. Okay. Thanks for having me, guys. Have fun this year, okay? Bye. Bye. Uh, Bye. All right. So um, I hope you guys enjoyed that. That was really interesting. I think the um, 